This program is brought to you by the partners and friends of Creflo Dollar Ministries. Coming up next on Changing Your World. Some of the most frustrated people I meet in the world are ones who go to church. Why are they not at rest? Why are they still feeling inferior? Why do they still feel like they're not accepted? Why do they still feel like they're going to hell? Why do they still feel the way they feel? Because they don't believe God loves them. And they're acting like the world, trying to seek acceptance. And you've already been accepted, but you won't believe it. So we travel around in different weird lifestyles, searching for what Jesus has already given us. When you give, your gift goes to work, spreading the gospel, uplifting communities, connecting believers from all over the world. It's easy to support the ministry with your giving through Change Express. The process of giving has never been easier for those on the go, so get started today. Go to www.creflodollarministries.org forward slash Change Express now to sign up for Change Express. Easy, automatic giving. So let's vow to make it a better place. Let every heart that needs to know your love is here to stay. Ooh, it's time we live a new life. Let us love shine bright in you. We're saved by His grace, so we embrace your love today. We are. Are y'all good? Yes. You still love me so far? Yes. Well, let's see if I can change that right here. John, <laughs> John chapter 16, verse 8 through 9. We're still in review. There's a lot of stuff going on. We say, all right, 16, 8, and 9. Verse 8, he says, uh, and when he has come, he will convict the world of, of, of sin and of, of righteousness and of judgment. Of sin, he says, because they do not believe in me. What matters is not your lifestyle, but your belief system. Now, let me, let me put a little bit more meat on that. What matters, as in the primary focus, as Christians, the primary focus is not your lifestyle, but your belief system, because what you believe would directly influence your behavior. See, what we've done is we've made the primary focus our behavior. What you're doing, what they're doing, how they live living, what they're doing. But you understand the Holy Ghost, can, he, he, he got a plan to change all that. But he can't do nothing until you, first of all, make your primary focus your belief in him. See, the Holy Spirit says, I'm going to go to work. See, we forget about the Holy Spirit. You, 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 well, you can't be a Christian because you're doing that. Yeah, but the Holy Ghost says, it, but they believe in me, I'm going to change it. Well, they can't be a Christian because of their lifestyle. Oh, yeah, Holy, Holy Ghost says, oh, yeah, but, but, but I'm, I'm working on that right now. He says, I'm, I can do the job. I'm equipped to do the job. I just need you to believe it. He says, I'm even working on people who don't know me because they don't believe me. I'm trying to convince them to believe me, and I can, I can change the behavior. We got it backwards. We have churches all over the world trying to change people's behavior. I can't change your behavior, but the Holy Ghost can if you believe in Him. He can work in you. Well, how He going to do that? Honey, it is so, he got so many ways to change you because nobody knows you like he knows you. And he can go right down deep in the root of where that attitude came from, right down deep in the root where that behavior came from. You might think that's you, and that's what the devil wants to do. He wants you to define your identity by your behavior. And God says, no, your identity is not defined by your behavior. I have given you an identity, and you should define yourself by who I made you. I made you righteous. I made you redeemed. I, I, I did that. But, but, but he wants to, the devil wants to define you by your behavior. He says, now believe in me. Believe in who I said you were, were and are, and I will change your behavior. behavior. I'm working on you. 
I'm going to take away your old desires. The stuff that you used to have, used to be a habit. That habit that you had that you just couldn't seem to break. You prayed and you prayed and it seemed like it was too late. Then you turn it over to Jesus and then you stop worrying about it. Gave it over to the Lord and he worked it out. Oh, yes. But you keep running into, but what, what do I do? But, but what do I do? But how do I change it? You can't! How many times you done tried to change your stupid nasty in the booth in the back in the corner in the dark habits that don't nobody know about, but you and Jesus? You know what he's waiting for? He's waiting for you to stick your hands up and say, I surrender. You know the greatest day of your life? You know the greatest day of your life is when you stick your hands up and say, I quit, God help me. And he said, by time, you out my way. I just need you to believe me and renew your mind. Renew your mind with this gospel. The more you renew your mind with this gospel, you're going to start thinking in line with this gospel, and it's going to keep on, it's going it's to work, and I'm going to do some stuff in you. You're going to wake up one day, and you might have this little thought in the back of wanting to return to that, but then when you think about returning to whatever it is he's delivering you out of, you found out you lost the desire for it. And, and, and your habits have lost their value, and you don't know how you did that. You didn't do that. The Holy Ghost came in and started rearranging your furniture. Yes. Oh, God, help me, Jesus. The solution to any and all areas of wrong behavior, the solution of toxic emotions, the solution of failure is the finished work of Jesus and hearing of the beauty and the love of, that God has displayed in Christ. See, you got to understand something. Oh, the theme is God's unmerited, abounding provision in the unrestricted operation of his love. His love is infinite. He loves you. And he says, you're restricting my love because you won't believe me. I don't need your education and I don't need your efforts. I need you to believe my unrestricted, infinite love that I love you so much, I'll heal you, I'll deliver you, I'll get you out of the toxicity, I'll deliver you from the debt, I'll take crazy from you, I'll take loneliness from you and I'll fill you with joy. I'll do everything that pertains to life and godliness. My love has been satisfied. I am no longer restricted where loving you is concerned because of my son, Jesus Christ. Now I can love you with no restrictions. Will you believe? Now that's not what religion says. Religion says you're smart, you're intelligent, you're going to take these scriptures, you're going to devise a little program, and you're going to do this three times a day, this four times a day, and you're going to put self-effort in there, and you're going to get involved in the gospel of performance, and then through your efforts and your sweat, then you're going you're gonna to go ahead and get it done. That's religion. That's tradition, and that is a slap in the face of a loving God who will still love you in spite of yourself. See, that's the deal. We've been acting so crazy, but don't think nothing wrong with it because our crazy couldn't stop him loving us. All of that stuff we believed, all of our unbelief, and he still was there. He was still fighting for you. He was still doing stuff in your ignorance. And somehow you thought you were okay because God was showing up here and there. His love moved him to do that. But it's not to ignore the truth because you can find areas where he loved you anyway. If you understand that, say amen. amen. Man, I don't think I'm going to make it off the, the uh, summary. Even as believers, we can sometimes believe, act, and live as if we were still in the domain of sin, can't we? 
Oh, I ain't here but two people. Can't we still act and live as if we were still in the domain of sin? Okay, let me make a complaint. How is it that you can be saved and still act the same way you used to act before you got saved? Yeah, you do. Yes, you do. Yes, you do. Somebody make you mad, you still cuss them out. Tell my Lord, forgive me. <laughs> but through the gospel of grace message, the Holy Spirit continually convinces us that in Christ we have been rescued from the mess and the junk of sinful, disobedient living. Look at Colossians chapter 1, 12 through 13. Here's where we stop. Let's look at this in NLT, Colossians 1, 12 through 13. Now we're picking up from where we stop. He says, always thanking the Father, He has enabled you to share in the inheritance that belongs to His people who live in the light, for He has rescued us from the kingdom of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of His dear Son. Somebody shout, I've been rescued. Jesus has qualified us to live without sin. He's qualified us to live without disobedience. He's qualified us to walk in step with His Spirit within us. He's qualified us. Now, I want to show you something. I want you to go to uh, St. John chapter 15, verses 1 through uh, 5 in the um, New King James Bible. Another way Jesus explains how God deals with those who are not producing healthy fruit. How does God deal with those who are not producing healthy fruit, fruit which many would view as disobedience? Uh, how, does he, right, how does He deal with those people who, who are not producing that, that healthy fruit? Tradition tells you, you know, you know, you're not doing right, so God's going to get you. Uh, you, you, you're, not, you're not bearing good fruit, so that's why you got cancer. You, you we're always, we always, sin gets the credit for all the bad thing that happened. You remember, I think in John 9, 1, uh, there was a boy, I think, who was born blind, and the disciples came by and they said, who sinned, the mother or the father, that this boy was born blind? And Jesus answered, he said, neither, nobody sinned, but that my glory might be seen. And that's the thing you got to stop doing. When bad stuff happens in your life, you shouldn't be asking, what sin caused this to happen? Who did sin for this to happen? Listen to me carefully. <laughs> Some of you think, well, you, you, you sound like we could just go out and do stuff. When you got the Holy Ghost and you believe, that's not going to be a part of the equation. You're not going to want to do that, so quit going that way as, as an excuse. Now, I'm going to use this illustration the Bible uses. And I don't know about you, but you've read it, you've heard it, but now I need to, I need to bring a picture, draw a picture to, so you can really see what he's talking about. He used this illustration uh, because it's actually what happens in reality when you're dealing with a vine and a branch. We're going to look at a, a wine dresser, a viticulturalist, I believe that's what it's called. Now look at verse 1. He says, I am the true vine. My father is the vine dresser. Mm. Isn't that interesting? I'm the true vine. My father's the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. Underline that phrase, he takes away. Religion teaches you that if you don't bear fruit, God's going to take you away. That, that, you know that can't be right. You know that can't be right. You get saved, and if you don't bear fruit, you're taken away. That means you're no longer saved anymore. You know that's not right. But it's okay that tradition tells you he's going to punish you, he's going to get you, he's going to get you. And you got to renew your mind where that's concerned. He says here, every branch in me that does not uh, bear fruit, he takes away, and every branch that bears fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the, of the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you're the branches. Somebody shout, I'm a branch. I say it again, I'm a branch. Okay, can a branch survive detached from the vine? So you want to know that? Go home and get something and break the branch off. He's using this illustration to illustrate our relationship with him. I'm the branch, he's the vine, attached to him, 
The vine is going to bear the fruit that will come through the branch. It doesn't work the other way around. The branch, I don't care how hard the branch work, it ain't never going to bear no fruit without the vine. Say out loud, I need, I need Jesus. Well, I'm going to be good. Well, I'm going to be patient. Where well, I'm going to be loving. Not, not without the vine. I don't care how many times you come to church. I don't care how many scriptures you memorize a day. Without the vine, without a personal relationship with him, you ain't bearing nothing. You're going to still be the same old hellacious person you've been all your life trying to be the vine, trying to be like the vine without the vine. You just, uh, you just, you just start a wood, that's all. That's the only thing you're good for is burn up. All right, now listen to me carefully. Pruning and being cut off or taken away, man, that sounds pretty painful, right? And the legalists, religious, traditional legalists people love to use this verse to say that unless we are obedient, we will find ourselves under the punishment of God. If you're not obedient, you will find yourself under the punishment of God because they're still defining obedience by actions. However, the Scripture says no such thing. In fact, the Greek term for cutting off these unfruitful branches, there are unfruitful branches that are attached to the vine. And the Scripture says, and, and this is the, the, the uh, I think the, 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 the Greek word here, for cutting off or taking off is the word arrow, A-I-R long O, arrow, which in this context it means, this is what arrow means, this phrase to take away or to cut off, it means, write this down, to elevate, to raise up, to lift up, to elevate, to raise up, to lift up. So what is he saying? Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he will elevate that branch. He will raise up that branch. He will lift up that branch. Now, in order to really understand why he chose to use this illustration, let's check out what, what vine trainers do. And, you know, you can, you can do it yourself. Go to Wikipedia and look up vine training, and it'll give you how they operate. It reveals that grape vines do not produce fruit unless they are exposed to sunlight. It's got to be exposed to sunlight. Now, if you don't train or lift the branches, then excessive shading will inhibit fruit production, and it will encourage disease. But the wine grower would never throw away a branch for that would be like amputating part of that vine. Unfruitful branches are lifted out of the dirt, lifted out of the shade, redressed so they can be nourished by the sun. All God is saying, as if you're not bearing fruit, <laughs> my job to, is to train you. I got to elevate you. Uh -huh. I got to lift you up out of the shade. I got to put you in a position where you can get some sunlight. So the Greek word for pruning that's used in John 15 more accurately is translated uh, as cleanse. And you see him mentioning that in, in those first four, four or five verses. So this is why Jesus declares his disciples who have been regularly hearing, he said his disciples who have been regularly hearing his word, he says, you're already clean. In verse 3, he says, you're already clean. You're already clean. He's talking about, you, you are hearing my word. You're already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. 
So it's, it's not just hearing any sermon, but it's hearing the, the, the sermon of the gospel that, that you're already clean, you're being pruned. When I, every time I sit up here and preach this gospel of grace, you're being pruned, you're being lifted up to the sunshine, you, you, you're being elevated where the sun shines, you're, you, you, you're, your thinking is, is not in the dark anymore, it's, it's elevated up here so you can get some light. After the disciples came back from being sent out, and in Luke chapter, uh, excuse me, Luke 9 and 1, I mentioned that, but this is when the uh, disciples were sent out with power and authority to heal, the authority to cast out devils. Remember Jesus sent them out and says, heal the sick and raise the dead, okay? They started arguing after they, they finished that mission. And their argument was, who's the greatest amongst us? They had an argument, all right, now they're in the shade. <laughs> They're in the shade. They're coming back. Well, who's the greatest now? I cast out three demons. How many did you cast out, John? <laughs> I got four people healed. How many did you get healed? He says, dude, you're, you're, you're in the shade now. You're in the shade now. And uh, in Luke 9, 46 and 48, Jesus said something. He was, he's responsible for lifting them up and elevating them. He said, uh, he started pruning away, pruning away that bad thinking, and, and you, can I show you this real quick? Luke chapter 9, 46 and 48, I don't want to go to it, because Jesus told him, let the greatest among you be your servant. <clears throat> and in verse 46, he says, then the disciples rose up among them as to which of them would be greatest, 47, and Jesus perceiving thoughts of their hearts took a little child and set him uh, by him. And he says, and it said unto him, whoever receives this little child in my name receives me, and whoever receives me uh, has sent me, for he who is least among you all will be grace, great. So the least, he said, will be the greatest. And another scripture he says talks about servanthood. The least of him will be the greatest. Now what happened when he did that? He pruned away their wrong thinking and he lifted, the, uh, lifted them up to a higher place in him. They got lifted up into a higher place in him. If, if you don't hear the gospel message being preached so you can be elevated out of um, uh, self-righteousness, be elevated out of shame, be elevated out of condemnation, be elevated out of pride, then you're not going to bear fruit. But the thing that's going to elevate you is the preaching of this gospel of grace. That's the point I'm trying to make. The thing that's going to elevate you is the preaching of what Jesus has already done for you. It's the preaching. You got to start thinking higher than what you're thinking. You keep thinking based on religion that you got it at your mom and them church when they, you know, you were working real hard to do what you needed to do to try to please God. And what you don't understand is God is already pleased. The day you got born again, He called you His beloved. You are loved by God. And you keep trying to do stuff to get Him to love you. You are loved by God. Say out loud, I am loved by God. Okay, the day you believe that you're loved by God, then that's the day you'll believe that when any mess takes place, it's not going to, you, you're not going to worry about that because I'm loved by God. The doctor say you're sick, I, I'm, 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 I'm good, I'm loved by God. Uh, you have lack in your life, I, I, it's, it's good, I'm loved by God. And, and I tell you what, the, illust the, the evidence of your faith is going to be your, your rest. When you can enter into rest, I, I, I can rest because I know I'm loved by God. I can rest when I'm sick because I know I'm loved by God. I can rest when I lost my job and I know I get another one because I'm loved by God. I can rest because relationship problems, but it's going to be all right. I know I'm loved by God. I can, I can rest. And that's what the issue is. Church people are not at rest. Church people are not at rest. Some of the most frustrated people I meet in the world are ones who go to church. Why are they not at rest? Why are they still feeling inferior? Why do they still feel like they're not accepted? Why do they still feel like they're going to hell? Why do they still feel the way they feel? Because they don't believe God loves them, and they're acting like the world, trying to seek acceptance, and you've already been accepted, but you won't believe it. So we travel around in different weird lifestyles, searching for what Jesus has already given us.
Are you focused on doing works so that God sees you as obedient? In the six message series, Is Your Belief System Offline? Creflo Dollar teaches that obedience is not measured by performance. It's simply believing and having faith in Jesus Christ. Everything we have and everything we get now as New Testament Christians, we get it because of what Jesus did. The Old Testament was all about you working for God. The New Testament is all about God working for you. Obedience in the New Testament is called belief. Disobedience is called unbelief. Jesus has delivered you from your sin and the Holy Ghost is changing your behavior. Order this life-changing CD series today for a love gift of just 35 U.S. dollars or more. This series is also available in DVD format for a love gift of 45 U.S. dollars or more. Visit CreflodollarMinistries.org and click eStore, scan the QR code, or call the number on your screen to order today. Calling all men. September 9th and 10th, join men from all over the world for Mentality Men's Conference. Our real authority is in our intimate relationship with God. You don't want to miss this free conference. Register now. Text MENTALITY to 51555 or scan the QR code on your screen. We came from God, gentlemen. If anybody needs to have a relationship with God and understand God, we should. We should be going around on our face, crying out before God. See you September 9th and 10th with Creflo Dollar. We should be the guys lifting our hands up in praise service. We should be closer to God than anybody. Everybody in our family is nourished by us. Visit CreflodollarMinistries.org and grab your free seat. Register now. Have you ever wondered how the financial support from our viewers makes a difference in people's lives? We receive testimonies every day from people whose lives have been shattered by natural disasters, failed marriages, bankrupt businesses, and so on. They share how our outreach efforts and messages about God's grace have changed their lives in a tangible way. And for that, we give God all the glory. Today, I invite you to prayerfully consider financially supporting this ministry. We know you'll be empowered to see real change in others and prosper in your own life. If God has placed it on your heart to support the vision of this ministry to reach the world with the gospel of grace, you may call in to make your financial donations or log on to CreflodollarMinistries.org. God bless you. Welcome to a place built for you. Where finding grace messages to watch is easy, where you can access CYWN anytime you want. Where getting spiritually fed anytime you want feels fulfilling, uplifting, simple. Visit your Roku, Amazon, or Apple TV app store and download the Creflo Dollar Ministries TV app now. For more information, visit CreflodollarMinistries.org. Join us online as we bring you praise and worship from the World Changers Church family and the Word of God from pastors Creflo Dollar and Taffy Dollar. For more information, visit us at CreflodollarMinistries.org. Because of you, Creflo Dollar Ministries is providing a new understanding of grace and empowering change in the lives of millions of people every day. Thank you, partners and friends. Your love and financial support makes it possible to bring this message into millions of homes all across the globe. The preceding program was brought to you by the partners and friends of Creflo Dollar Ministries.